Hello, everybody. Um, I am going to give you a bit of a reflection on algorithms in niche modeling. Um, this will be brief, but essentially, um, this is a, a cautionary tale or a just so story about um, how things come to be dominant in science and uh, how that reflects on what we do in the field of ecological niche modeling. So this is just maybe a, a lighter and more fun talk, uh, but the idea is it, it needs to present uh, a reflection on how, how fads get started or how, how movements or, or um, strong currents get started. And just, just give you a little bit of a, of a uh, maybe an alternative viewpoint, um, but this is just for you to think about. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to. There we go. So this is kind of also a uh, a movie themed talk, uh, which is to say. I will talk to you about um, three sorts of movies or three movies. And again, it's mainly just to get you to laugh in the middle of what might be an otherwise uh, rather boring little talk. Um, but let's jump into this because I think these are useful things to think about. And I want you to have this um, kind of in mind. Um, the, the paper that is kind of at the center of this is one that was uh, led by uh, my colleague Jane Eliff. And you can see a lot of names on the author list that you will recognize. Um, full disclosure, I'm an author on it as well. Uh, but you'll see Jorge and you'll see Rob Anderson and, and a bunch of people that are talking in this course. Um, this isn't a criticism of the paper, but maybe a bit, a bit of a criticism of our community, uh, a self-criticism, if you will. Um, but it's just something to think about. And essentially, this paper uh, presented what I like to call the good, bad, and the ugly uh, graphic. Um, and it became something that kind of tacitly described and outlined and, and uh, channeled the development of our uh, of our tiny little area of inquiry um, rather dominantly. So let, let's let's explore this more. So this paper is powerful. It is the fourth most cited paper in ecology. Um, in this blog post in 2012. I haven't looked for it uh, since then, but it is um, massively cited and um, has gotten a huge amount of attention. Um, here it is a little bit more recently, and you can see total numbers of citations up to 7,380. Um, and so, Part of it is it was the right paper at the right time. It provided a lot of uh, guidance as far as um, as far as which methodologies our field could use. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure that I agree with it, and the rest of this talk will be um, kind of a again a self criticism or a a, a, a sequence of thinking events that led. Um, me and some others to, to kind of revisit this paper. So again, you know, this is a paper that, that we were working on in the early 2000s, and um, we published in 2006. Um, essentially, what we did in this paper was to explore, I believe it was 14 um, different modeling algorithms that could be used for ecological niche model development. And there are things that you've probably never heard of if you're just starting in this field. 
things like GARP um, really fell by the wayside uh, and are really not even um, supported anymore. Um, and of course, there are things in here that you've definitely heard of, such as MaxM. Uh, so we, we essentially implemented these, these 14 um, modeling algorithms and applied them to 600 some species from a bunch of regions. And in each case, the question was whether presence only data could potentially be used to anticipate powerfully the spatial distribution of presences and absences in an independent data set. Now where this paper ended up, I'm going to jump over the details, but I'll put it online for you to, uh, to have access to. Where this paper really ended up was this graphic. It's figure three in the original paper, and it was a graph of AUC score, which is something that you will learn more about in the evaluation section of this class, this course. Um, the, the methodology was basically new to niche modeling as of this paper. And another evaluation methodology was this correlation methodology, which was also new to niche modeling. Um, AUC went on to, to world domination uh, and is still used by many people, although I would disagree with using raw rock AUCs. Uh, and this, this correlation-based method um, got used very little after this paper and a couple companion papers. But essentially both were measures of model um, quality. I'm not going to go into whether and why I would agree or disagree with uh, them as measures of model quality. But suffice it to say they, under some circumstances, would measure model quality, and the 14 different methods kind of spread out with a generally positive relationship between them, but they spread out along these, these two axes. And if you focus your eyes rather carefully, you get three groups, these, these, and these. Perfect models would be out in this region and perfectly bad models down in this region. And so it was very easy to call this graph the graph of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so that's where um, this paper kind of made some very concrete recommendations. And you can see, for example, that, that Maxent is up here in the good part, and other um, algorithms, BioClim, and Domain, and, and Lives, and especially um, interesting at that point in history was that Desktop GARP came out amongst the, the ugly as well. So essentially, this was, a, this was a kind of right place, right time paper. It did something that that this set of uh, techniques and this field or this, this toolkit was needing at that point. Um, but let's, let's, let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Uh, we're back to our good, bad, and the ugly. And we need to ask ourselves, um, how much should we follow this as a guide? So that leads us to essentially the next step in the evolution of our field, which was the idea of one God only. And uh, again, I'm, I'm being facetious in this, but essentially what I'm talking about is the idea that um, should our field home in on a single tool for developing these models? In this case, it would be MaxM. Um, you're going to hear a lot about Maxent in this course. In fact, you already have. And the question is, is that advisable that we use only one algorithm? And so um, 
here we can look at one of the papers that did the initial presentation of Maxent is led by Stephen Phillips. And the second author was Rob Anderson, who's already given a talk in this course, published in Ecological Modeling, and it presented this, this new, then new approach to, to fitting niche models or distribution models. And back to that blog about the most cited papers in ecology. Well, here we go in eighth place, that paper. And I will mention that there were a few other publications that could be seen as presenting this methodology to our community. So the actual numbers of citations are actually quite a bit higher than just a thousand citations. And of course, this paper has accumulated quite a number more citations since this blog post. Ah, there it is. Um, let's see, 8,355 as of when I pulled down these, these summaries of the, um, of the citation records of this, of this paper. So I think perhaps a, a most useful um, paper regarding Maxent is, is this one uh, led by Jane Elith and another that's led by Corey Merrow. I'll put both of those up on the, on the site for you all. Uh, but essentially, this is a, this is a, um, a methodology that's become so dominant and so popular that we essentially have the equivalent of those books that are like, you know, um, Pascal for dummies or Fortran for dummies. Well, we have Maxent for dummies like me who maybe are a little more challenged by, by Stephen Phillips' original papers on this methodology. Um, but I'll just show you one paragraph out of this paper. Uh, Maxent's predictive performance is consistently competitive with the highest performing methods. Uh, since becoming available in 2004, it's been utilized extensively for modeling species distributions. Um, and here's the Maxent for dummies part. Existing descriptions include concepts from machine learning that tend to be outside the common experience of many ecologists. So, I'm not arguing that Maxent is not a very useful tool, but I would like to bring up that the evidence for it as a dominant tool is not uh, universal and not overwhelming. Uh, I'm not going to go into a critique of our 2006 paper, the one led by Jane Elith. It has some some things that we would do differently, or at least I would do differently at this point in history. Um, but I just want to show you this result as an example. This is a paper that I did with Mona Papij and Muir Eaton years ago. Um, it was seen as a response to Garp, uh, sorry, to, to, the, uh, to the Elith et al. paper. Uh, it wasn't really intended as that. It was more intended as a comment on overfitting by these models. Essentially what we did was a spatial transfer. Here you can see uh, from morning dove, a very, very well sampled species. You can see the positive data, the occurrences either as black boxes or dotted circles, and the negative data as these X's. And so we can just kind of look at this and see a rather diffuse northern border, particularly in this region. We can see something that looks kind of like avoiding deserts. Um, but this is an extremely widespread species. And so what we did was we took the median longitude and latitude of the occurrence points. We divided the available occurrence data into four quadrants above and below the median of latitude and longitude. And that gave us this separation. And so we're going to do this, this trick of taking the on-diagonal elements, using them to develop a model, 
and using them to predict the off-diagonal elements. And we ended up doing this with three algorithms, uh, with Maxent, with GARP, which was a, another machine learning technique at the time, and then a very simple distance-based algorithm. Um, and that was mainly for purposes of illustration. And what I want you to see is kind of a, a simple outcome um, for three species. And we have, I guess here I've only shown two of the algorithms, GARP and Maxent. And this is in this, this rock space, this receiver operating characteristic space. So the perfect model would go up and in a very small area, identify all of the, um, all of the occurrences. So this is essentially zero omission. And so, and this is a trace of predicted area. And so in the smallest area possible, sorry, it would come up to zero omission and then come over. And what I want you to see is that uh, for th this is the on diagonal predicts off and off diagonal predicts on, but the solid symbols are for GARP and the open symbols are for Maxent. And what I want you to see is that the GARP and the Maxent symbols are on the same curve in essentially all of these cases, maybe a minor exception here and here. But essentially what was happening in, in um, GARP looking bad in terms of rock is that GARP doesn't make a low prevalence prediction like down into these proportional predicted areas. And so the rock curve for GARP began with a straight line connecting that first dot with the origin of the graph. And so the area under the curve looked pretty bad. You'll, you'll, you'll understand these rock approaches better when we get to model evaluation. But I'm, I'm simply showing you this because um, I don't think that our evaluations of model performance in the 2006 paper were the very best ways to evaluate model performance. But really, Maxent went on to be chosen by our community. And my personal opinion is that that is a consequence of it having a very, very well engineered user interface. Uh, it's had very few breakdowns in its, what, 14 years, 16 years of history. Um, you know, more power to Stephen Phillips and his associates in developing really nice software. And then in making it open so that it could be run from R and things like that. Well, so we have the, the chosen uh, single god in our, in our pantheon, um, and it may not be something we can walk away from. But I do want to give you a, a, um, a reflection on that. Uh, you know, this is the idea of silver bullets. And for those of you who are not um, familiar with cheesy B movies, uh, the idea is that a werewolf cannot be killed by a conventional bullet, but if you shoot a werewolf with a silver bullet, it will die. Well, the silver bullet would probably kill me as well. So the question is whether there is a single bullet that we could use for ecological niche modeling that would essentially um, do a good job with all of the modeling challenges. And so with a couple colleagues, and I'll show you the paper in a moment, um, I started exploring this idea of silver bullets or no free lunches. Um, and so here are just some, some comics and some illustrations of how this idea of no free lunch or no silver bullet um, is pretty dominant and pretty broadly distributed across our, uh, our world. 
So this is a this is a serious theorem in the literature on optimization. So here's a paper, uh, no free lunch theorems for optimization. And I I wanted you to see here's a statement of it. Uh, a number of no free lunch theorems are presented which establish that for any algorithm, any elevated performance over one class of problems is offset by performance over another class. Which is to say, and this, this is the same thing as silver bullets, if you do really well at one kind of challenge, you're probably not going to do as well in another kind of challenge. So that's where we want to think about different niche modeling algorithms. So my colleagues in that inquiry were Jorge Soberon and especially Hui Jie Chiao, who did all of the computation uh, with his usual um, amazing ability. But essentially what, what we set up was a set of rather different modeling challenges. So for example, here is a, an environmental cloud for some region. And we chose, you can see there are areas that have very dense or very sparse representation in that environmental space. So we chose some niches that were in very dense areas and other niches that are in very sparse areas in terms of representation. And we chose big niches and small niches. And so essentially we set ourselves up to have some very different modeling challenges in this study. And we reproduced a graphic. It's not exactly like the good, the bad, and the ugly graphic. But essentially what it is is two measures of model quality. And in fact, we do it for estimating A, the suitable area, or estimating the occupied distribution, G sub O. But my point is, this is the same sort of graphic as the one that I called in jest the good, the bad, and the ugly. And here we see our different algorithms arrayed by average performance. And so we might turn this into a good and bad and ugly. This one's a little harder to do, but essentially, again, up here in the upper right area is really good models. And down here in the lower left area is really bad models. And I just want you to see that this is the parallel graphic to the one that we presented in the 2006 Elith et al. paper. But what we argue in, in the No Silver Bullets paper is that this is based on average performance. So here you're seeing some measure of you know, average and variation around that average. And it certainly looks like this algorithm is markedly better than this one, and this one's better than this one, right? But it's based on average performance. And so that's basically saying all of these different niche modeling challenges that we erected in this study are kind of the same thing, and we're going to see which one is best. <coughs> so that is using a good, bad, and the ugly graphic to choose one god in the sky and assuming that we have silver bullets. Sorry about the bad movie references, but that. So let's look at this from a, another perspective. Again, this particular graphic and its, its sister graphic in the Elith et al. paper are based on average performance over many different niche modeling challenges. Let's look at it a different way. So what we've done here is we created these virtual species. And because they're virtual species, we know what are presences of those niche conditions and what are absences. There's no error, there's no sampling bias, there's no nothing, it's right. We know what is yes and what is no. 
And that allows us to use statistics like Kappa and TSS uh, as measures of how good our modeling predictions were. This will not work, these, these statistics will not work for presence absence modeling, or sorry, presence only modeling. But we'll, we'll come around to that in the evaluation part of this course. Um, suffice it to say that these are decent measures of model quality that we've used. And what I want you to see in this graphic is for kappa regarding A, the habitable area, and for kappa regarding G sub O, the occupied area, and using kappa and TSS, we counted the frequency with which each modeling algorithm was the best when viewed across these two different metrics of model quality and two different uh, target uh, entities that we're trying to estimate. And the point that I want you to come home with or go home with is in at least one case, each one of these modeling algorithms was best. Which is to say, for a particular species, maybe random forests was best. And for another species, maybe GAMs were best. The point is, if you take those same data or those same types of data on average performance that we had in the Elith et al. paper and the earlier figure in the Chow et al. paper, this, this view of model performance based on averaging over distinct modeling challenges is probably not a good way to view our world. And instead, we ought to ask, what is the best algorithm for this particular challenge? And so you can very easily imagine setting up for any modeling challenge, you can imagine setting up a, a, uh, a test where you mimic the overall challenge that you're trying to meet, maybe estimating the niche of a given species. You test preliminary models and you say, okay, in this particular species, for this particular landscape, with these, these data input, the best algorithm is actually this particular one. Use that. Now, Maxent is very popular, but that would be a no silver bullets approach to choosing model algorithms. So, what's happened here? I have an amazing team of software engineers and biologists that wrote some really cool software. There was a paper written by some very capable people who were the, the or many of the voices in the field at that point in time, wrote a very popular paper. And they created a tool that has become dominant in distributional ecology. Nobody's gonna dispute that Maxent is a useful tool. I'm right with you, I use it all the time. But the evidence for its undoubted and unchallenged superiority is neither firm nor robust. And in fact, what I showed you with the No Silver Bullets paper is that if you analyze, here I've said properly, but if you analyze uh, with a different set of lenses in front of your eyes, you get a very different answer that no single algorithm will be best under all circumstances. So that's kind of an alternative viewpoint or a, a, a challenge to our uh, Maxent focused uh, view of ecological niche modeling. Um, again, I use Maxent on good days. I also use other algorithms. And I would encourage you to as well. The rest of this section of this course, we're gonna hear about a bunch of tools that we have available to us. And I would encourage you to use them and not just Maxent. Uh, 
the sad truth about our community is that some amongst us are rather uncritical. And so you will frequently be urged by reviewers who will say, well, yeah, okay, you did the test. Maxent didn't yield as good predictions for this particular species, but I still want to see the Maxent model. I don't think that is evidence driven and a healthy approach to science. So that's why I wanted to give this talk and give you guys a bit of a challenge to be evidence driven and use the best algorithm for your particular modeling challenge. I hope this has been useful. I hope I haven't offended anybody. I certainly haven't been trying to. Uh, and I hope that we can have some good discussions about this um, when we come around to the question and answer session. Okay, take care everybody. Have a good week.